The Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress is a four-engined heavy bomber developed in the 1930s for the United States Army Air Corps USAAC. Competing against Douglas and Martin for a contract to build 200 bombers, the Boeing entry prototype model 299, XB-17 outperformed both competitors and exceeded the Air Corps' performance specifications. Although Boeing lost the contract to the Douglas B-18 Bolo because the prototype crashed, the Air Corps ordered 13 more B-17s for further evaluation. From its introduction in 1938, the B-17 Flying Fortress evolved through numerous design advances, becoming the third most produced bomber of all time, behind the four-engined B-24 and the multirole, twin-engined Ju-88. The B-17 was primarily employed by the USAAF in the daylight strategic bombing campaign of World War II against German industrial and military targets. The United States 8th Air Force, based at many airfields in central and southern England, and the 15th Air Force, based in Italy, complemented the RAF Bomber Command's nighttime area bombing in the Combined Bomber Offensive to help secure air superiority over the cities, factories and battlefields of Western Europe in preparation for the invasion of France in 1944. The B-17 also participated to a lesser extent in the war in the Pacific, early in World War II, where it conducted raids against Japanese shipping and airfields. From its pre-war inception, the USAAC by June 1941, the USAAF promoted the aircraft as a strategic weapon. It was a relatively fast, high-flying, long-range bomber with heavy defensive armament at the expense of bombload. It developed a reputation for toughness based upon stories and photos of badly damaged B-17s safely returning to base. The B-17 dropped more bombs than any other U.S. aircraft in World War II, of the 1.5 million tons of bombs dropped on Nazi Germany and its occupied territories by U.S. aircraft, 640,000 tons were dropped from B-17s. In addition to its role as a bomber, the B-17 was also employed as a transport, anti-submarine aircraft, drone controller, and search and rescue aircraft. As of May 2015, ten aircraft remain airworthy, though none of them were ever flown in combat. Dozens more are in storage or on static display. The oldest of these is a D-series flown in combat in the Pacific and the Caribbean. Topic. Development Topic origins On 8 August 1934, the USAAC tendered a proposal for a multi-engine bomber to replace the Martin B-10. The Air Corps was looking for a bomber capable of reinforcing the Air Forces in Hawaii, Panama, and Alaska. Requirements were for it to carry a useful bombload at an altitude of 10,000 feet 3, meters for 10 hours with a top speed of at least 200 miles per hour 320 kilometers per hour. They also desired, but did not require, a range of 2,000 miles 3, kilometers and a speed of 250 miles per hour 400 kilometers per hour. The competition for the Air Corps contract was to be decided by a fly-off between Boeing's design, the Douglas DB-1, and the Martin Model 146 at Wilbur Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. The prototype B-17, with the Boeing factory designation of Model 299, was designed by a team of engineers led by E. Gifford Emery and Edward Curtis Wells, and was built at Boeing's own expense. It combined features of the company's experimental XB-15 bomber and 247 transport. 
The B-17's armament consisted of 5.30 caliber mm machine guns, with a payload up to 4,800 pounds 2, of bombs on two racks in the bomb bay behind the cockpit. The aircraft was powered by four Pratt and Whitney R1690 Hornet radial engines, each producing 750 horsepower, 600 kilowatts at 7000 feet, 2100 meters. The first flight of the Model 299 was on the 28th of July 1935 with Boeing chief test pilot Leslie Tower at the controls. The day before, Richard Williams, a reporter for the Seattle Times, coined the name Flying Fortress when, observing the large number of machine guns sticking out from the new airplane, he described it as a 15-ton flying fortress in a picture caption. The most distinct mount was in the nose, which allowed the single machine gun to be fired toward nearly all frontal angles. Boeing was quick to see the value of the name and had it trademarked for use. Boeing also claimed in some of the early press releases that Model 299 was the first combat aircraft that could continue its mission if one of its four engines failed. On 20 August 1935, the prototype flew from Seattle to Wright Field in 9 hours and 3 minutes with an average cruising speed of 252 miles per hour 406 kilometers per hour, much faster than the competition. At the fly-off, the four-engined Boeing's performance was superior to those of the twin-engined DB-1 and Model 146. Major General Frank Maxwell Andrews of the GHQ Air Force believed that the capabilities of large four-engined aircraft exceeded those of shorter-ranged, twin-engined aircraft, and that the B-17 was better suited to new, emerging USAAC doctrine. His opinions were shared by the Air Corps procurement officers, and even before the competition had finished, they suggested buying 65 B-17s. Development continued on the Boeing Model 299, and on the 30th of October 1935, Army Air Corps test pilot Major Ployer Peter Hill and Boeing employee Les Tower took the Model 299 on a second evaluation flight. The crew forgot to disengage the gust locks, which locked control surfaces in place while the aircraft was parked on the ground, and after takeoff, the aircraft entered a steep climb, stalled, nosed over, and crashed, killing Hill and Tower. Other observers survived with injuries. The crashed Model 299 could not finish the evaluation, disqualifying it from the competition. While the Air Corps was still enthusiastic about the aircraft's potential, Army officials were daunted by its cost. Douglas quoted a unit price of $58,200, equivalent to $1.06 million today, based on a production order of 220 aircraft, compared with $99,620, $1.82 million today, from Boeing Army Chief of Staff. Mollen Craig cancelled the order for 65 Yada Bytes 17s, and ordered 133 of the twin engined Douglas B 18 Bolo, instead. The loss was not total. But Boeing's hopes for a substantial bomber contract were dashed. <laughs> Initial orders Regardless, the USAAC had been impressed by the prototype's performance, and on 17 January 1936, through a legal loophole, the Air Corps ordered 13 Yada Bites 17s designated Y1B17 after November 1936 to denote its special F-1 funding for service testing. The YB-17 incorporated a number of significant changes from the Model 299, including more powerful Wright R-182039 Cyclone engines. 
Although the prototype was company owned and never received a military serial, the B-17 designation itself did not appear officially until January 1936, nearly three months after the prototype crashed. The term XB-17 was retroactively applied to the NX 13372's airframe and has entered the lexicon to describe the first flying fortress. Between 1 March and 4 August 1937, 12 of the 13 Y-1B-17s were delivered to the Second Bombardment Group at Langley Field in Virginia for operational development and flight tests. One suggestion adopted was the use of a pre-flight checklist to avoid accidents such as that which befell the Model 299. In one of their first missions, three B-17s, directed by lead navigator Lt. Curtis LeMay, were sent by General Andrews to intercept and photograph the Italian ocean liner Rex 610 miles 980 kilometers off the Atlantic coast. The mission was successful and widely publicized. The 13th Y-1B-17 was delivered to the Material Division at Wright Field, Ohio, to be used for flight testing. A 14th Y-1B-17 (37–369), originally constructed for ground testing of the airframe's strength, was upgraded and fitted with exhaust-driven General Electric turbochargers. Scheduled to fly in 1937, it encountered problems with the turbochargers, and its first flight was delayed until 29 April 1938. The aircraft was delivered to the Army on 31 January 1939. Once service testing was complete, the Y-1B-17s and Y-1B-17A were redesignated B-17 and B-17A, respectively, to signify the change to operational status. Opposition to the Air Corps' ambitions for the acquisition of more B-17s faded, and in late 1937, ten more aircraft designated B-17B were ordered to equip two two bombardment groups, one on each U.S. coast. Improved with larger flaps and rudder and a well-framed, 10-panel plexiglass nose, the B-17Bs were delivered in five small batches between July 1939 and March 1940. In July 1940, an order for 512 B-17s was issued, but at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, fewer than 200 were in service with the Army. A total of 155 B-17s of all variants was delivered between the 11th of January 1937 and the 30th of November 1941, but production quickly accelerated, with the B-17 once holding the record record for the highest production rate for any large aircraft. The aircraft went on to serve in every World War II combat zone, and by the time production ended in May 1945, 12,731 aircraft had been built by Boeing, Douglas, and Vega a subsidiary of Lockheed. Though the crash of the prototype 299 in 1935 had almost wiped out Boeing, now it was seen as a boon. Instead of building models based on experimental engineering, Boeing had been hard at work developing their bomber and now had versions ready for production far better than would have been possible otherwise. One of the most significant weapons of World War II would be ready, but only by a hair. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Design and variants. The aircraft went through several alterations in each of its design stages and variants. 
Of the 13 Yatta Bytes 17s ordered for service testing, 12 were used by the second bomb group of Langley Field, Virginia, to develop heavy bombing techniques, and the 13th was used for flight testing at the Material Division at Wright Field, Ohio. Experiments on this aircraft led to the use of a quartet of General Electric turbo superchargers which would become standard on the B-17 line. A 14th aircraft, the YB-17A, originally destined for ground testing only and upgraded with the turbochargers, was redesignated B-17A after testing had finished. As the production line developed, Boeing engineers continued to improve upon the basic design. To enhance performance at slower speeds, the B-17B was altered to include larger rudders and flaps. The B-17C changed from three bulged, oval-shaped machine gun blisters to two flush, oval-shaped machine gun window openings, and on the lower fuselage, a single bathtub machine gun gondola housing, which resembled the similarly configured and located Bodenlafette Bola. Ventral defensive emplacement on the German Heinkel He 111P series medium bomber. While models A through D of the B-17 were designed defensively, the large-tailed B-17E was the first model primarily focused on offensive warfare. The B-17E was an extensive revision of the Model 299 design, the fuselage was extended by 10 feet 3.0 meters, a much larger rear fuselage, vertical tailfin, rudder, and horizontal stabilizer were added to the design, a gunner's position was added in the new tail, the nose especially the bombardier's well-framed, 10-panel nose glazing remained relatively the same as the early earlier B through D versions had, but with the addition of a Sperry electrically powered manned dorsal gun turret just behind the cockpit, and the similarly powered also built by Sperry manned ventral ball turret just aft of the bomb bay, replacing a relatively hard-to-use, Sperry model 645705D remotely operated ventral turret on the earliest examples of the E variant resulted in a 20% increase in aircraft weight. The B-17's turbocharged Wright R1820 Cyclone 9 engines were upgraded to increasingly more powerful versions of the same powerplants multiple times throughout its production, and similarly, the number of machine gun emplacement locations was increased to enhance the aircraft's combat effectiveness. The B-17F variants were the primary versions flying for the 8th Air Force to face the Germans in 1943, and had standardized the manned Sperry ball turret for ventral defense, replacing the earlier, 10-panel well-framed bombardier's nose glazing from the B subtype with an enlarged, nearly frameless plexiglass bombardier's nose enclosure for improved forward vision. Two experimental versions of the B-17 were flown under different designations, the XB-38 Flying Fortress and the YB-40 Flying Fortress. The XB-38 was an engine test bed for Allison V-1710 liquid-cooled engines, should the right engines normally used on the B-17 become unavailable. The only prototype XB-38 to fly crashed on its ninth flight, and the type was abandoned. The Allison V-1710 was allocated to fighter aircraft, the YB-40 was a heavily armed modification of the standard B-17 used before the North American P-51 Mustang, an effective long-range fighter, became available to act as escort. Additional armament included an additional dorsal turret in the radio room, a remotely operated and fired Bendix built chin turret directly below the bombardier's accommodation, and twin .50 in .7 mm guns in each of the waist positions. The ammunition load was over 11,000 rounds. 
All of these modifications made the YB40 well over 10,000 pounds heavier than a fully loaded B-17F. The YB-40s with their numerous heavy modifications had trouble keeping up with the lighter bombers once they had dropped their bombs, so the project was abandoned and finally phased out in July 1943. The final production blocks of the B-17F from Douglas's plants did, however, adopt the YB-40s chin turret, giving them a much improved forward defense capability. By the time the definitive B-17G appeared, the number of guns had been increased from 7 to 13, the designs of the gun stations were finalized, and other adjustments were completed. The B-17G was the final version of the Flying Fortress, incorporating all changes made to its predecessor, the B-17F, and in total, 8,680 were built, the last by Lockheed on 28 July 1945. Many B-17 GSEs were converted for other missions such as cargo hauling, engine testing, and reconnaissance. Initially designated SB-17G, a number of B-17 gigaseconds were also converted for search and rescue duties, later to be redesignated B-17H. Late in World War II, at least 25 B-17s were fitted with radio controls and television cameras, loaded with 20,000 pounds of high explosives and dubbed BQ-7 Aphrodite missiles for Operation Aphrodite. The operation, which involved remotely flying Aphrodite drones onto their targets by accompanying CQ-17. Mothership control aircraft was approved on the 26th of June 1944 and assigned to the 388th Bombardment Group stationed at RAF Furs Field, a satellite of RAF Netishal. The first four drones were sent to Mamoyek, the Syracourt V-1 bunker, Watton, and Wizerns on the 4th of August, causing little damage. The project came to a sudden end with the unexplained mid-air explosion over the Blith estuary of a B-24, part of the United States Navy's contribution as Project Anvil, en route for Heligoland piloted by Lt. Joseph P. Kennedy, Jr., future U.S. President John F. Kennedy's elder brother. Blast damage was caused over a radius of 5 miles kilometers. British authorities were anxious that no similar accidents should again occur, and the Aphrodite project was scrapped in early 1945. <laughs> Operational history The B-17 began operations in World War II with the Royal Air Force in 1941, and in the Southwest Pacific with the U.S. Army. The 19th Bombardment Group had deployed to Clark Field in the Philippines a few weeks before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor as the first of a planned heavy bomber buildup in the Pacific. Half of the group's B-17s were wiped out on 8 December 1941 when they were caught on the ground during refueling and rearming for a planned attack on Japanese airfields on Formosa. The small force of B-17s operated against the Japanese invasion force until they were withdrawn to Darwin, in Australia's Northern Territory. In early 1942, the 7th Bombardment Group began arriving in Java with a mixed force of B-17s and LB-30, B-24s. A squadron of B-17s from this force detached to the Middle East to join the first provisional bombardment group, thus becoming the first American B-17 squadron to go to war against the Germans. 
After the defeat in Java, the 19th withdrew to Australia, where it continued in combat until it was sent home by General George C. Kenney when he arrived in Australia in mid-1942. In July 1942, the first USAAF B-17s were sent to England to join the 8th Air Force. Later that year, two groups moved to Algeria to join 12th Air Force for operations in North Africa. The B-17s were primarily involved in the Daylight Precision strategic bombing campaign against German targets ranging from U-boat pens, docks, warehouses, and airfields to industrial targets such as aircraft factories. In the campaign against German aircraft forces in preparation for the invasion of France, B-17 and B-24 raids were directed against German aircraft production while their presence drew the Luftwaffe fighters into battle with Allied fighters. Early models proved to be unsuitable for combat use over Europe and the B-17E was first successfully used by the USAAF. The defense expected from bombers operating in close formation alone did not prove effective, and the bombers needed fighter escorts to operate successfully. During World War II, the B 17 equipped 32 overseas combat groups, inventory peaking in August 1944 at 4,574 USAAF aircraft worldwide. B-17s dropped 640,036 short tons, 580,631 metric tons of bombs on European targets compared to 452,508 short tons, 410,508 metric tons dropped by the Liberator and 463,544 short tons, 420,520 metric tons dropped by all other U.S. aircraft. The British heavy bombers, the Avro Lancaster and Handley Page Halifax, dropped 608,612 long tons 681,645 short tons and 224,207 long tons 251,112 short tons respectively. Topic. RAF use The RAF entered World War II with no heavy bomber of its own in service, the biggest available were long-range medium bombers such as the Vickers Wellington, which could carry up to 4,500 pounds 2, of bombs. While the short Sterling and Handley Page Halifax became its primary bombers by 1941, in early 1940, the RAF entered into an agreement with the U.S. Army Air Corps to acquire 20 B-17Cs, which were given the service name Fortress I. Their first operation, against Wilhelmshaven on 8 July 1941 was unsuccessful. On 24 July three B-17s of 90 Squadron took part in a raid on the German capital ship Gneisenau and Prinz Eugen anchored in Brest from 30,000 feet 9, meters, with the objective of drawing German fighters away from 18 Handley Page Hamptons attacking at lower altitudes, and in time for 79 Vickers Wellingtons to attack later with the German fighters refueling. The operation did not work as expected, with 90 squadrons' fortresses being unopposed. By September, the RAF had lost eight B 17Cs in combat and had experienced numerous mechanical problems, and Bomber Command abandoned daylight bombing raids using the Fortress I because of the aircraft's poor performance. The experience showed both the RAF and USAAF that the B-17C was not ready for combat, and that improved defenses, larger bomb loads and more accurate bombing methods were required. 
However the USAAF continued using the B-17 as a day bomber, despite misgivings by the RAF that attempts at daylight bombing would be ineffective, as use by Bomber Command had been curtailed, the RAF transferred its remaining Fortress I aircraft to Coastal Command for use as a long-range maritime patrol aircraft, instead. These were later augmented in August 1942 by 19 Fortress Mk2 B17F and 45 Fortress Mkiia B17E. A fortress from No. 206 Squadron RAF sank U-627 on 27 October 1942, the first of 11 U-boat kills credited to RAF fortress bombers during the war, the RAF's No. 223 Squadron, as part of 100 Group, operated a number of fortresses equipped with an electronic warfare system known as Airborne Cigar ABC. This was operated by German-speaking radio operators who were to identify and jam German ground controllers' broadcasts to their night fighters. They could also pose as ground controllers themselves with the intention of steering night fighters away from the bomber streams. Topic: <laughs> Initial USAAF operations over Europe. The Air Corps, renamed United States Army Air Forces USAAF, on 20 June 1941 used the B-17 and other bombers to bomb from high altitudes with the aid of the then-secret Norden bombsite, known as the Blue Ox, which was an optical electromechanical gyrostabilized analog computer. The device was able to determine, from variables put in by the bombardier, the point at which the aircraft's bombs should be released to hit the target. The bombardier essentially took over flight control of the aircraft during the bomb run, maintaining a level altitude during the final moments before release. The USAAF began building up its air forces in Europe using B 17S soon after entering the war. The first 8th Air Force units arrived in High Wycombe, England, on 12 May 1942, to form the 97th Bomb Group. On 17 August 1942, 12 B-17S of the 97th, with the lead aircraft piloted by Major Paul Tibbets and carrying Brigadier General Ira Eaker as an observer, were close escorted by four squadrons of RAF Spitfire IXs and a further five squadrons of Spitfire Verses to cover the withdrawal on the first USAAF heavy bomber raid over Europe, against the large rail Railroad marshalling yards at Rouen Sotteville in France, while a further six aircraft flew a diversionary raid along the French coast. The operation, carried out in good visibility, was a success, with only minor damage to one aircraft, unrelated to enemy action, and half the bombs landing in the target area. The raid helped allay British doubts about the capabilities of American heavy bombers in operations over Europe. Two additional groups arrived in England at the same time, bringing with them the first B 17Fs, which served as the primary AAF heavy bomber fighting the Germans until September 1943. As the raids of the American bombing campaign grew in numbers and frequency, German interception efforts grew in strength such as during the attempted bombing of Kiel on 13 June 1943, such that unescorted bombing missions came to be discouraged. <laughs> Combined offensive The two different strategies of the American and British Bomber Commands were organized at the Casablanca Conference in January 1943. The resulting, "...combined bomber offensive," 
weakened the Wehrmacht, destroyed German morale, and established air superiority through Operation Point Blank's destruction of German fighter strength in preparation for a ground offensive. The USAAF bombers attacked by day, with British operations, chiefly against industrial cities, by night. Operation Point Blank opened with attacks on targets in Western Europe. General Ira C. Eaker and the 8th Air Force placed highest priority on attacks on the German aircraft industry, especially fighter assembly plants, engine factories, and ball bearing manufacturers. Attacks began in April 1943 on heavily fortified key industrial plants in Bremen and Recklinghausen. Since the airfield bombings were not appreciably reducing German fighter strength, additional B 17 groups were formed, and Eker ordered major missions deeper into Germany against important industrial targets. The 8th Air Force then targeted the ball-bearing factories in Schweinfurt, hoping to cripple the war effort there. The first raid on 17 August 1943 did not result in critical damage to the factories, with the 230 attacking B-17s being intercepted by an estimated 300 Luftwaffe fighters. The Germans shot down 36 aircraft with the loss of 200 men, and coupled with a raid earlier in the day against Regensburg, a total of 60 B-17s was lost that day. A second attempt on Schweinfurt on the 14th of October 1943 later came to be known as Black Thursday. While the attack was successful at disrupting the entire works, severely curtailing work there for the remainder of the war, it was at an extreme cost. Of the 291 attacking fortresses, 60 were shot down over Germany, 5 crashed on approach to Britain, and 12 more were scrapped due to damage, a loss of 77 B-17s. Additionally, 122 bombers were damaged and needed repairs before their next flights. Of 2,900 men in the crews, about 650 did not return, although some survived as prisoners of war. Only 33 bombers landed without damage. These losses were a result of concentrated attacks by over 300 German fighters. Such high losses of aircrews could not be sustained, and the USAAF, recognizing the vulnerability of heavy bombers to interceptors when operating alone, suspended daylight bomber raids deep into Germany until the development of an escort fighter that could protect the bombers all the way from the United Kingdom to Germany and back. At the same time, the German night fighting ability noticeably improved to counter the nighttime strikes, challenging the conventional faith in the cover of darkness. The 8th Air Force alone lost 176 bombers in October 1943, and was to suffer similar casualties on the 11th of January 1944 on missions to Oschersleben, Halberstadt, and Brunswick. Lieutenant General James Doolittle, commander of the 8th, had ordered the second Schweinfurt mission to be cancelled as the weather deteriorated, but the lead units had already entered hostile air space and continued with the mission. Most of the escorts turned back or missed the rendezvous, and as a result, 60 B 17s were destroyed. A third raid on Schweinfurt on 24 February 1944 highlighted what came to be known as Big Week, during which the bombing missions were directed against German aircraft production. German fighters needed to respond, and the North American P-51 Mustang and Republic P-47 Thunderbolt fighters equipped with improved drop tanks to extend their range accompanying the American heavies all the way to and from the targets engaged them. 
The escort fighters reduced the loss rate to below 7%, with only 247 B-17s lost in 3,500 sorties while taking part in the Big Week raids. By September 1944, 27 of the 42 bomb groups of the 8th Air Force and 6 of the 21 groups of the 15th Air Force used B-17s. Losses to flak continued to take a high toll of heavy bombers through 1944, but the war in Europe was being won by the Allies. And by 27 April 1945, two days after the last heavy bombing mission in Europe, the rate of aircraft loss was so low that replacement aircraft were no longer arriving and the number of bombers per bomb group was reduced. The combined bomber offensive was effectively complete. Topic: Pacific Theater. On the 7th of December 1941, a group of 12 B-17s of the 38th 4B-17C and 88th 8B-17E reconnaissance squadrons, en route to reinforce the Philippines, was flown into Pearl Harbor from Hamilton Field, California, arriving while surprise attack on Pearl Harbor was going on. Leonard Smitty. Smith Humiston, co-pilot on First Lieutenant Robert H. Richards B-17C, AAFS, N-40-2049, reported that he thought the U.S. Navy was giving the flight a 21-gun salute to celebrate the arrival of the bombers, after which he realized that Pearl Harbor was under attack. The fortress came under fire from Japanese fighter aircraft, though the crew was unharmed with the exception of one member who suffered an abrasion on his hand. Japanese activity forced them to divert from Hickam Field to Bellows Field. On landing, the aircraft overran the runway and ran into a ditch, where it was then strafed. Although initially deemed repairable, 40 minus 2049, 11th BG, 38th RS, received more than 200 bullet holes and never flew again. Ten of the twelve fortresses survived the attack. By 1941, the Far East Air Force FEAF based at Clark Field in the Philippines had 35 B-17s, with the War Department eventually planning to raise that to 165. When the FEAF received word of the attack on Pearl Harbor, General Louis H. Brereton sent his bombers and fighters on various patrol missions to prevent them from being caught on the ground. Brereton planned B-17 raids on Japanese air fields in Formosa, in accordance with Rainbow Five War Plan directives, but this was overruled by General Douglas MacArthur. A series of disputed discussions and decisions, followed by several confusing and false reports of air attacks, delayed the authorization of the sortie. By the time the B-17s and escorting Curtis P-40 Warhawk fighters were about to get airborne, they were destroyed by Japanese bombers of the 11th Air Fleet. The FEAF lost half its aircraft during the first strike, and was all but destroyed over the next few days. Another early World War II Pacific engagement, on 10 December 1941, involved Colin Kelly, who reportedly crashed his B 17 into the Japanese battleship Haruna, which was later acknowledged as a near bomb miss on the heavy cruiser Ashigara. Nonetheless, this deed made him a celebrated war hero. Kelly's B 17C AAFS, N 40 2045, 19th BG, 30th BS, crashed about 6 miles 10 km from Clark Field after he held the burning fortress steady long enough for the surviving crew to bail out. Kelly was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. 
Noted Japanese ace Saburo Sakai is credited with this kill, and in the process, came to respect the ability of the fortress to absorb punishment. B 17s were used in early battles of the Pacific with little success, notably the Battle of Coral Sea and Battle of Midway. While there, the 5th Air Force B 17s were tasked with disrupting the Japanese sea lanes. Air Corps doctrine dictated bombing runs from high altitude, but they soon found only 1% of their bombs hit targets. However, B-17s were operating at heights too great for most A-6M-0 fighters to reach. The B-17's greatest success in the Pacific was in the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, in which aircraft of this type were responsible for damaging and sinking several Japanese transport ships. On 2 March 1943, six B-17s of the 64th Squadron flying at 10,000 feet 3, meters attacked a major Japanese troop convoy off New Guinea, using skip bombing to sink Kyokusei Maru, which carried 1,200 army troops, and damaged two other transports, Taiyo Maru and Najima. On 3 March 1943, 13 B-17s flying at 7,000 feet 2, meters bombed the convoy, forcing the convoy to disperse and reducing the concentration of their anti-aircraft defenses. The B-17s attracted a number of Mitsubishi A6M-0 fighters, which were in turn attacked by the P-38 Lightning escorts. One B-17 broke up in the air, and its crew was forced to take to their parachutes. Japanese fighter pilots machine gunned some of the B-17 crew members as they descended and attacked others in the water after they landed. Five of the Japanese fighters strafing the B-17 aircrew were promptly engaged and shot down by three lightnings, though these were also then lost. The Allied fighter pilots claimed 15 Zeros destroyed, while the B-17 crews claimed five more. Actual Japanese fighter losses for the day were seven destroyed and three damaged. The remaining seven transports and three of the eight destroyers were then sunk by a combination of low-level strafing runs by Royal Australian Air Force bowfighters, and skip bombing by USAAF North American B-25 Mitchells at 100 feet 30 meters, while B-17s claimed five hits from higher altitudes. On the morning of 4 March 1943, a B-17 sank the destroyer Asashio with a 500 pounds bomb while she was picking up survivors from Arashio. At their peak, 168 B-17 bombers were in the Pacific Theater in September 1942, but already in mid-1942 General Arnold had decided that the B-17 was uns suitable for the kind of operations required in the Pacific and made plans to replace all of the B-17s in the theater with B-24s and later, B-29s as soon as they became available. Although the conversion was not complete until mid-1943, B-17 combat operations in the Pacific theater came to an end after a little over a year. Surviving aircraft were reassigned to the 54th Troop Carrier Wing's Special Airdrop Section, and were used to drop supplies to ground forces operating in close contact with the enemy. Special Airdrop B 17s supported Australian commandos operating near the Japanese stronghold at Rabaul, which had been the primary B 17 target in 1942 and early 1943. B 17s were still used in the Pacific later in the war, however, mainly in the combat search and rescue role. A number of B-17 gigaseconds, redesignated B-17Hs and later SB-17 gigaseconds, were used in the Pacific during the final year of the war to carry and drop lifeboats to stranded bomber crews who had been shot down or crashed at sea. 
These aircraft were nicknamed Dumbos, and remained in service for many years after the end of World War II. Topic. Bomber defense Before the advent of long-range fighter escorts, B-17s had only their .50 caliber M2 Browning machine guns to rely on for defense during the bombing runs over Europe. As the war intensified, Boeing used feedback from aircrews to improve each new variant with increased armament and armor. Defensive armament increased from 40.50 in 12.7 mm machine guns and 10.30 in 7.62 mm nose machine gun in the B17C to 130.50 in 12.7 mm machine guns in the B17G. But because the bombers could not maneuver when attacked by fighters, and needed to be flown straight and level during their final bomb run, individual aircraft struggled to fend off a direct attack. A 1943 survey by the USAAF found that over half the bombers shot down by the Germans had left the protection of the main formation. To address this problem, the United States developed the bomb group formation, which evolved into the staggered combat box formation in which all the B-17s could safely cover any others in their formation with their machine guns. This made a formation of bombers a dangerous target to engage by enemy fighters. In order to more quickly form these formations, assembly ships, planes with distinctive paint schemes, were utilized to guide bombers into formation, saving assembly time. Luftwaffe fighter pilots likened attacking a B-17 combat box formation to encountering a Fliegen's Stachelschwein, flying porcupine with dozens of machine guns in a combat box aimed at them from almost every direction. However, the use of this rigid formation meant that individual aircraft could not engage in evasive maneuvers, they had to fly constantly in a straight line, which made them vulnerable to German flak. Moreover, German fighter aircraft later developed the tactic of high-speed strafing passes rather than engaging with individual aircraft to inflict damage with minimum risk. As a result, the B-17's loss rate was up to 25% on some early missions. It was not until the advent of long-range fighter escorts particularly the North American P-51 Mustang and the resulting degradation of the Luftwaffe as an effective interceptor force between February and June 1944, that the B-17 became strategically potent. The B-17 was noted for its ability to absorb battle damage, still reach its target and bring its crew home safely. Wally Hoffman, a B-17 pilot with the 8th Air Force during World War II, said, "...the plane can be cut and slashed almost to pieces by enemy fire and bring its crew home." Martin Caden reported one instance in which a B-17 suffered a mid-air collision with a Focke Wolf FW-190, losing an engine and suffering serious damage to both the starboard horizontal stabilizer and the vertical stabilizer, and being knocked out of formation by the impact. The B-17 was reported as shot down by observers, but it survived and brought its crew home without injury. Its toughness was compensation for its shorter range and lighter bomb load compared to the B-24 and British Avro Lancaster heavy bombers. Stories circulated of B-17s returning to base with tails shredded, engines destroyed and large portions of their wings destroyed by flak. This durability, together with the large operational numbers in the 8th Air Force and the fame achieved by the Memphis Bell, made the B-17 a key bomber aircraft of the war. 
Other factors such as combat effectiveness and political issues also contributed to the B-17 success. Topic: <laughs> Luftwaffe attacks. After examining wrecked B-17s and B-24s, Luftwaffe officers discovered that on average it took about 20 hits with 20 mm shells fired from the rear to bring them down. Pilots of average ability hit the bombers with only about 2% of the rounds they fired, so to obtain 20 hits, the average pilot had to fire 1,020 mm rounds at a bomber. Early versions of the FW-190, one of the best German interceptor fighters, were equipped with two 20 mm in MGFF cannons, which carried only 500 rounds when belt-fed normally using 60-round drum magazines in earlier installations, and later with the better Mauser MG-151 20th cannons, which had a longer effective range than the M MGFF weapon. Later versions carried four or even six MG 151 20th cannon and twin 13 mm machine guns. The German fighters found that when attacking from the front, where fewer defensive guns were mounted and where the pilot was exposed and not protected by armor as he was from the rear, it took only four or five hits to bring a bomber down. To rectify the FW 190's shortcomings, the number of cannons fitted was doubled to four, with a corresponding increase in the amount of ammunition carried, creating the Sturmbach bomber destroyer version. Version. This type replaced the vulnerable twin engine Zerstorer heavy fighters, which could not survive interception by P 51 Mustangs flying well ahead of the combat boxes in an air supremacy role starting very early in 1944 to clear any Luftwaffe defensive fighters from the skies. By 1944, a further upgrade to Rheinmetall Borsig's 30 mm (1.2 in) Mk 108 cannons mounted either in the wing or in underwing conformal mount gun pods was made for the Sturmbach Fock Wolfs as either the R2 or R8 field modification kits, enabling aircraft to bring a bomber down with just a few hits. The adoption of the 21 cm Nebelwerfer derived Werfer Granate 21 WFR GR 21 rocket mortar by the Luftwaffe in mid August 1943 promised the introduction of a major standoff style of offensive weapon. One strut mounted tubular launcher was fixed under each wing panel on the Luftwaffe's single engine fighters, and two under each wing panel of a few twin engine BF 110 Daylight Zerstorer aircraft. However, due to the slow 715 miles per hour velocity and characteristic ballistic drop of the fired rocket, despite the usual mounting of the launcher at about 15 degrees upward orientation, and the small number of fighters fitted with the weapons, the WFR GR 21 never had a major effect on the combat box formations of fortresses. The Luftwaffe also fitted heavy caliber Bordcan 1 series 37, 50 and even 75 mm in cannon as anti-bomber weapons on twin-engine aircraft such as the special Ju 88P fighters, as well as one model of the Mi-410 Hornies but these measures did not have much effect on the American strategic bomber offensive. The Mi-262, however, had moderate success against the B-17 late in the war. 
with its usual nose-mounted armament of four Mk-108 cannons, and with some examples later equipped with the R-4M rocket, launched from underwing racks, it could fire from outside the range of the bomber's .50 in .7 mm defensive guns and bring an aircraft down with one hit, as both the Mk-108's shells and the R-4M's warheads were filled with the shattering force of the strongly brescent hexagen military explosive topic <inaudible> luftwaffe captured b17s during world war 2 after crash landing or being forced down approximately 40 b17s were captured and refurbished with about a dozen put back into the air given german balkan cruise national markings on their wings and fuselage sides and hacken cruise Swastika tail fin flashes. The captured B 17s were used to determine the B 17s vulnerabilities and to train German interceptor pilots in attack tactics. Others, with the cover designations Dornier Du 200 and Du 288, were used as long range transports by the Kampfgeschwader 200 Special Duties Unit, carrying out agent drops and supplying secret airstrips in the Middle East and North Africa. They were chosen specifically for these missions as being more suitable for this role than other available German aircraft, they never attempted to deceive the Allies and always wore full Luftwaffe markings. One B-17 of KG-200, bearing the Luftwaffe's KG-200 Geschwaderkennung combat wing code markings A-3 plus FB, was interned by Spain when it landed at Valencia Airfield, 27 June 1944, remaining there for the rest of the war. It has been alleged that some B-17s kept their Allied markings and were used by the Luftwaffe in attempts to infiltrate B-17 bombing formations and report on their positions and altitudes. According to these allegations, the practice was initially successful, but Army Air Force combat aircrews quickly developed and established standard procedures to first warn off, and then fire upon any stranger trying to join a group's formation topic <inaudible> soviet interned b17s the us did not offer b17s to the soviet union as part of its war materiel assistance program but at least 73 aircraft were acquired by the soviet air force these aircraft had landed with mechanical trouble during the shuttle bombing raids over Germany or had been damaged by a Luftwaffe raid in Poltava. The Soviets restored 23 to flying condition and concentrated them in the 890th Bomber Regiment of the 45th Bomber Division, but they never saw combat. In 1946 the regiment was assigned to the Kazan factory to aid in the Soviet effort to reproduce the more advanced Boeing B-29 as the Tupolev Tu-4. <laughs> Swiss interned B-17s During the Allied bomber offensive, U.S. and British bombers sometimes flew into Swiss airspace, either because they were damaged or, on rare occasions, accidentally bombing Swiss cities. Swiss aircraft attempted to intercept and force individual aircraft to land, interning their crews. One Swiss pilot was killed, shot down by a U.S. bomber crew in September 1944. From then on, red and white neutrality bands were added to the wings of Swiss aircraft to stop accidental attacks by Allied aircraft. Official Swiss records identify 6,501 airspace violations during the course of the war, with 198 foreign aircraft landing on Swiss territory and 56 aircraft crashing there. 
In October 1943 the Swiss interned Boeing B-17F25VE, tail number 25841, and its U.S. flight crew after the Flying Fortress developed engine trouble after a raid over Germany and was forced to land. The aircraft was turned over to the Swiss Air Force, who then flew the bomber until the end of the war, using other interned but non-airworthy B-17s for spare parts. The bomber was repainted a dark olive drab, but retained its light grey painted under surfaces. It carried Swiss National White Cross insignia in red squares on both sides of its rudder, fuselage sides, and the underside wings, with white crosses in red roundels atop both upper wings. On its grey under surfaces, the B-17F also carried light grey flash letters, Road, and I, on either side of the Swiss National insignia. Topic. Japanese captured B-17s Three damaged B-17s, one D model and two E models, were rebuilt to flying status by Japanese technicians and mechanics with parts stripped from B-17 wrecks in both the Philippines and the Netherlands East Indies. The three bombers, containing captured top-secret Norden bombsites, were then flown to Japan where they underwent extensive technical evaluation by the Imperial Japanese Army Air Forces Air Technical Research Laboratory at Tachikawa. The D model was later deemed an obsolescent design. The two E Models were used to develop B-17 air combat counter tactics and also as enemy aircraft in several Japanese propaganda films. One of the captured E flying fortresses was photographed by U.S. aerial recon and code named Tachikawa 105. After its wing span was measured, photo recon analysts never identified it as a captured B-17 until after the war. No traces of these captured flying fortresses were found in Japan by Allied occupation forces, and they were assumed scrapped late in the war for their vital war materials. Topic. Post-war history Topic: U.S. Air Force Following the end of World War II, the B-17 was quickly phased out of use as a bomber and the Army Air Forces retired most of its fleet. Flight crews ferried the bombers back across the Atlantic to the United States where the majority were sold for scrap and melted down, although significant numbers remained in use in second-line roles such as VIP transports, air-sea rescue and photo reconnaissance. Strategic Air Command SAC, established in 1946, used reconnaissance B-17s at first called F-9 F for Photorecon, later RB-17 until 1949. With the disestablishment of the U.S. Army Air Forces and the establishment of an independent U.S. Air Force in 1947, most extant B-17s were transferred to USAF. The USAF Air Rescue Service of the Military Air Transport Service MATS operated B-17s as so-called Dumbo Air Sea Rescue Aircraft. Work on using B-17s to carry airborne lifeboats had begun in 1943, but they entered service in the European theater only in February 1945. They were also used to provide search and rescue support for B-29 raids against Japan. 
About 130 B 17s were converted to the air sea rescue role, at first designated B 17H and later SB 17G. Some SB 17s had their defensive guns removed, while others retained their guns to allow use close to combat areas. The SB-17 served through the Korean War, remaining in service with USAF until the mid-1950s See also, 3205th Drone Group in 1946, surplus B-17s were chosen as drone aircraft for atmospheric sampling during the Operation Crossroads atomic bomb tests, being able to fly close to or even through the mushroom clouds without endangering a crew. This led to more widespread conversion of B-17s as drones and drone control aircraft, both for further use in atomic testing and as targets for testing surface-to-air and air-to-air -air missiles. 107 B-17s were converted to drones. The last operational mission flown by a USAF fortress was conducted on 6 August 1959, when a DB-17P, serial 4483684, directed a QB-17G, out of Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico, as a target for an AIM-4 Falcon air-to-air -air missile fired from a McDonnell F-101 Voodoo. A retirement ceremony was held several days later at Holloman AFB, after which 4483684 was retired. It was subsequently used in various films and in the 1960s television show 12 O'Clock High before being retired to the Plains of Fame Aviation Museum in Chino, California. Perhaps the most famous B-17, the Memphis Bell, has been restored, with the B-17D the swoos underway, to its World War II wartime appearance by the National Museum of the United States Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. U.S. <laughs> Navy and Coast Guard During the last year of World War II and shortly thereafter, the United States Navy USN acquired 48 ex-USAAF B-17s for patrol and air-sea rescue work. The first two ex-USAAF B-17s, a B-17F later modified to B-17G standard, and a B-17G were obtained by the Navy for various development programs. At first, these aircraft operated under their original USAAF designations, but on 31 July 1945 they were assigned the Naval Aircraft Designation PB-1, a designation which had originally been used in 1925 for the Boeing Model 50 experimental flying boat. 32B-17 gigaseconds were used by the Navy under the designation PB-1. 1W, the suffix W indicating an airborne early warning role. A large redome for an S-band and APS-20 search radar was fitted underneath the fuselage and additional internal fuel tanks were added for longer range, with the provision for additional underwing fuel tanks. Originally, the B-17 was also chosen because of its heavy defensive armament, but this was later removed. These aircraft were painted dark blue, the standard Navy paint scheme which had been adopted in late 1944. PB-1Ws continued in USN service until 1955, gradually being phased out in favor of the Lockheed WV-2 known in the USAF as the EC-121, a designation adopted by the USN in 1962, a military version of the Lockheed 1049 Constellation commercial airliner. In July 1945, 16 B-17 
Marines were transferred to the Coast Guard via the Navy. These aircraft were initially assigned U.S. Navy Bureau numbers, BUNO, but were delivered to the Coast Guard designated as PB-1 Giga Second beginning in July 1946. Coast Guard PB-1 Giga Second were stationed at a number of bases in the U.S. and Newfoundland, with five at Coast Guard Air Station Elizabeth City, North Carolina, two at CGAS San Francisco, two at NAS Argentia, Newfoundland, one at CGAS Kodiak, Alaska, and one in Washington State. They were used primarily in the Dumbo air-sea rescue role, but were also used for iceberg patrol duties and for photo mapping. The Coast Guard PB-1 Giga Second served throughout the 1950s, the last example not being withdrawn from service until 14 October 1959. Topic special operations B-17s were used by the CIA front companies Civil Air Transport, Air America and Intermountain Aviation for special missions. These included B-17G44-855531, registered as N809Z. These aircraft were primarily used for agent drop missions over the People's Republic of China, flying from Taiwan, with Taiwanese crews. Four B-17s were shot down in these operations. In 1957 the surviving B-17s had been stripped of all weapons and painted black. One of these Taiwan-based B-17s was flown to Clark Air Base in the Philippines in mid-September, assigned for covert missions into Tibet. On 28 May 1962, N809Z, piloted by Connie Sagrist and Douglas Price, flew Major James Smith, USAF and Lieutenant Leonard A. Lashak, USNR to the abandoned Soviet Arctic Ice Station NP-8, as Operation Coldfeet. Smith and Lashak parachuted from the B-17 and searched the station for several days. On 1 June, Sagrist and Price returned and picked up Smith and Lashak using a Fulton Skyhook system installed on the B-17. N-809Z was used to perform a Skyhook pickup in the James Bond movie Thunderball in 1965. This aircraft, now restored to its original B-17G configuration, is on display in the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon. Topic: <laughs> Operators. The B-17, a versatile aircraft, served in dozens of USAAF units in theaters of combat throughout World War II, and in other roles for the RAF. Its main use was in Europe, where its shorter range and smaller bombload relative to other aircraft did not hamper it as much as in the Pacific theater. Peak USAAF inventory in August 1944 was 4,574 worldwide. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Surviving aircraft. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Fortresses as a symbol. The B-17 Flying Fortress became symbolic in the United States of that country's air power. In a 1943 Consolidated Aircraft poll of 2,500 men in cities where Consolidated adverts had been run in newspapers, 73% had heard of the B-24 and 90% knew of the B-17. After the first B-17s were delivered to the Air Corps Second Bombardment Group, they were used on flights to promote their long-range and navigational capabilities. 
In January 1938, Group Commander Colonel Robert Olds flew a YB-17 from the United States' east coast to its west coast, setting a transcontinental record of 13 hours 27 minutes. He also broke the west to east coast record on the return trip, averaging 245 miles per hour, 394 kilometers per hour in 11 hours 1 minute. Six bombers of the second bombardment group took off from Langley Field on the 15th of February 1938 as part of a goodwill flight to Buenos Aires, Argentina. Covering 12,000 miles kilometers, they returned on 27 February, with seven aircraft setting off on a flight to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, three days later. In a well-publicized mission on 12 May of the same year, three B-17s intercepted and took photographs of the Italian ocean liner SS Rex 610 miles 980 kilometers off the Atlantic coast. Many pilots who flew both the B-17 and the B-24 preferred the B-17 for its greater stability and ease in formation flying. Its electrical systems were less vulnerable to damage than the B-24's hydraulics, and the B-17 flew better than the B-24 when missing an engine. During the war, the largest offensive bombing force, the 8th Air Force, had an open preference for the B-17. Lieutenant General Jimmy Doolittle wrote about his preference for equipping the 8th with B-17s, citing the logistical advantage in keeping field forces down to a minimum number of aircraft types with their individual servicing and spares. For this reason, he wanted B-17 bombers and P-51 fighters for the 8th. His views were supported by 8th Air Force statisticians, whose studies showed that fortresses had utility and survivability much greater than that of the B-24. Making it back to base on numerous occasions despite extensive battle damage, its durability became legendary. Stories and photos of B-17s surviving battle damage were widely circulated during the war. Despite an inferior performance and smaller bombload than the more numerous B-24, a survey of 8th Air Force crews showed a much higher rate of satisfaction in the B-17. <laughs> Notable B-17s All-American, this B-17F survived having her tail almost cut off in a mid-air collision over Tunisia but returned safely to base in Algeria. Chief Seattle, sponsored by the City of Seattle, it disappeared on 14 August 1942 flying a recon mission for the 19th BG, 435th BS and the crew declared dead on 7 December 1945. Hell's Kitchen, B-17F41-243921 of only three early B-17Fs in 414th BS to complete more than 100 combat missions. Mary Ann, a B-17D that was part of an unarmed flight which left Hamilton Air Field, Novato, California on 6 December 1941 en route to Hickam Field in Hawaii, arriving during the attack on Pearl Harbor. The plane and its crew were immediately forced into action on Wake Island and in the Philippines during the outbreak of World War II. It became famous when its exploits were featured in Air Force, one of the first of the patriotic war films released in 1943. Memphis Bell, one of the first B-17s to complete a tour of duty of 25 missions in the 8th Air Force and the subject of a feature film, now completely restored and on display since May 17, 2018 at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force at Wright-Patterson AFB in Dayton, Ohio. 
Miss Every Morning Fixin, B17C. Previously named Pamela. Stationed in Mackay, Queensland, Australia during World War II. On 14 June 1943, crashed shortly after takeoff from Mackay while ferrying U.S. Forces personnel back to Port Moresby, with 40 of the 41 people on board killed. It remains the worst air disaster in Australian history. The sole survivor, Foy Roberts, married an Australian and returned to the States. He died in Wichita Falls, Texas, on 4 February 2004. Murder Inc. A B-17 bombardier wearing the name of the B-17, Murder Inc., on his jacket was used for propaganda in German newspapers. Old 666B-17E flown by the most highly decorated crew in the Pacific Theater. Royal Flush, B-17F-42-6087 from the 100th Bomb Group and commanded on one mission by highly decorated USAAF officer Robert Rosenthal, it was the lone surviving 100th BGB-17 of the 10th of October 1943 raid against Munster to return to the unit's base at RAF Thorpe Abbotts. Sir Baboon Magoon, B-17F featured in the June 1944 issue of Popular Science magazine and the 1945 issue of Flying magazine. Articles discuss mobile recovery crews following October 1943 belly landing at Tannington, England. The Swoos, initially nicknamed Ole Betsy while in service, the Swoos is the only remaining intact B-17D, built in 1940, the oldest surviving flying fortress, and the only surviving B-17 to have seen action in the Philippines Campaign 1941-42, it is in the collection of the National Air and Space Museum and is being restored for final display at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force at Wright-Patterson AFB in Dayton, Ohio. The Swoos was flown by Frank Kurtz, father of actress Swoozy Kurtz, who named his daughter after the bomber. Ye Old Pub, the B-17 that Franz Stigler did not shoot down, as memorialized in the painting, A Higher Call, by John D. Shaw. Five grand 5,000th B-17 made, emblazoned with Boeing employee signatures, served with the 333rd Bomb Squadron, 96th Bomb Group in Europe, damaged and repaired after gear-up landing, transferred to 388th Bomb Group. Returned from duty following VE Day, flown for war bonds tour, then stored at Kingman, Arizona. Following an unsuccessful bid for museum preservation, the aircraft was scrapped. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Accidents and incidents. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Noted B-17 pilots and crew members. Topic: Medal of Honor recipients. Many B-17 crew members received military honors, and 17 received the Medal of Honor, the highest military decoration awarded by the United States. Brigadier General Frederick Castle, flying as co-pilot, awarded posthumously for remaining at controls so others could escape damaged aircraft. 2nd LT Robert Femoyer Navigator awarded posthumously 1st LT Donald J Gott Pilot awarded posthumously 2nd LT David R Kingsley Bombardier awarded posthumously for tending to injured crew and giving up his parachute to another 1st LT William R Lolly Jr Heroism and exceptional flying skill. 
Sergeant Archibald Matties, engineer gunner, awarded posthumously. First LT Jack W Mathis, bombardier, posthumously, the first airman in the European theater to be awarded the Medal of Honor. Second LT William E Metzger Jr., co-pilot, awarded posthumously. First LT Edward Michael. First LT John C Morgan. Capt. Harl Pease, awarded posthumously. Second LT Joseph Sarnowski, awarded posthumously. S. Sergeant Maynard H. Smith, gunner. First LT Walter E. Trumper, awarded posthumously. T. Sergeant Forrest L. Vosler, radio operator. Brigadier General Kenneth Walker Commanding Officer of V Bomber Command, killed while leading small force in raid on Rabaul, awarded posthumously Maj J. Zemer Jr. Pilot earned on unescorted reconnaissance mission in Pacific, same mission as Sarnowski. Other military achievements or events Lincoln Broyhill, tail gunner on a B-17 in the 483rd Bombardment Group. He received a Distinguished Unit Citation, and set two individual records in a single day, one most German jets destroyed by a single gunner in one mission two, and two most German jets destroyed by a single gunner during the entirety of World War II. Allison C. Brooks 1917 a B-17 pilot who was awarded numerous military decorations, and was ultimately promoted to the rank of Major General and served in active duty until 1971. First LT Eugene Emmond 1921 lead pilot for Man O War II Horsepower Limited. Received the Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Medal with three oak leaf clusters, American Theater Ribbon and Victory Ribbon. Was part of D-Day and witnessed one of the first German jets when a Mi-262A1 a flew through his formation over Germany. One of the youngest bomber pilots in the U.S. Army Air Forces. Emanuel J. Klett 1918-1988, second-generation German-American whose 91 combat missions were the most flown by any 8th Air Force pilot in World War II. Capt. Colin Kelly 1915-1941, pilot of the first U.S. B-17 lost in action. Colonel Frank Kurtz 1911 to 1996, the USAAF's most decorated pilot of World War II, commander of the 463rd Bombardment Group, Heavy, 15th Air Force, Salone Field, Foggia, Italy. Clark Field, Philippines, attack survivor. Olympic bronze medalist in diving, 1932, 1944, 1945. Father of actress Swoozy Kurtz, herself named for the still surviving B-17D mentioned above. Jen Curtis LeMay (1906–1990) became head of the Strategic Air Command and chief of staff of the USAF. LT Colonel Nancy Love (1914–1976) and Betty Hyler Gillies (1908–1998), the first women pilots to be certified to fly the B-17 in 1943 and to qualify for the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron. SSGT Alan McGee 1919 B-17 gunner who on 3 January 1943 survived a 22,000-foot freefall after his aircraft was shot down by the Luftwaffe over Saint-Nazaire. Colonel Robert K. Morgan 1918 pilot of Memphis Bell. 
LT Colonel Robert Rosenthal 1917 to 2007 commanded the only surviving B17 Royal Flush of a US 8th Air Force raid by the 100th Bomb Group on Munster on the 10th of October 1943 completed 53 missions Earned 16 medals for gallantry, including one each from Britain and France, and led the raid on Berlin on the 3rd of February 1945. That is likely to have ended the life of Roland Freisler, the infamous hanging judge of the People's Court. First LT Bruce Sundlin, 1920-2011, pilot of Dam Yankee of the 384th Bomb Group, was shot down over Belgium on 1 December 1943 and evaded capture until reaching Switzerland 5 May 1944. Brig Gen Paul Tibbets 1915 to 2007 flew with the 97th Bombardment Group heavy with both the 8th Air Force in England and the 12th Air Force in North Africa later pilot of the B29 Enola Gay dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima Japan the final crew of the bomber Ye Old Pub December 20, 1943, flew home from Bremen, Germany in a bomber that was a miracle in the fact that it was flying. The crew earned a total of nine silver stars and one Air Force Cross. B-17 in popular culture Hollywood featured the B-17 in its period films, such as director Howard Hawke's Air Force starring John Garfield and Twelve O'Clock High starring Gregory Peck. Both films were made with the full cooperation of the United States Army Air Forces and used USAAF aircraft and for Twelve O'Clock High combat footage. In 1964, the latter film was made into a television show of the same name and ran for three years on ABC TV. Footage from 12 O'Clock High was also used, along with three restored B-17s, in the 1962 film The War Lover. The B-17 also appeared in the 1938 movie Test Pilot with Clark Gable and Spencer Tracy, with Clark Gable in command decision in 1948, in Tora. Tora. Tora, in 1970, and in Memphis Bell with Matthew Modine, Eric Stoltz, Billy Zane, and Harry Connick Jr. in 1990. The most famous B-17, the Memphis Bell, toured the U.S. with its crew to reinforce national morale and to sell war bonds. It starred in a USAAF documentary, Memphis Bell, a story of a flying fortress, B-17s are seen flying and crashing in flames in the British film The Way to the Stars. The song, Icarus II, Born on Wings of Steel, by Kansas, from their album Somewhere to Elsewhere, has lyrics sung by Steve Walsh that describe the heroic sacrifice a B-17 pilot makes to save his crew after they are hit and going down, ordering them to jump, leaving him to steer the dying plane to its end. The B-17 has also been featured in artistic works expressing the physical and psychological stress of the combat conditions and the high casualty rates that crews suffered. Works such as The Death of the Ball Turret Gunner by Randall Yarrail and Heavy Metal S Section B-17 depict the nature of these missions. The Ball Turret itself has inspired works like Steven Spielberg's The Mission. Artists who served on the bomber units also created paintings and drawings depicting the combat conditions in World War II. Topic: <laughs> Specifications B17G Data from the Encyclopedia of World Aircraft General Characteristics 
crew, 10, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, nose gunner, flight engineer, top turret gunner, radio operator, waist gunners, 2, ball turret gunner, tail gunner, length, 74 feet 4 in 22.66 meters, wingspan, 103 feet 9 in 31.62 meters, Height, 19 feet 1 in 5.82 meters. Wing area, 1,420 square feet 132 square meters. Airfoil, NACA 0018, NACA 0010. Empty weight, 36,135 pounds 16,391 kilograms. Gross weight, 54,000 pounds, 24,494 kilograms. Max takeoff weight, 65,500 pounds, 29,710 kilograms. Aspect ratio, 7.57. Power plant, 4 times right R182097. Cyclone. Turbosupercharged radial engines, 1,200 horsepower, 890 kilowatts each performance. Maximum speed, 287 miles per hour, 462 kilometers per hour, 249 kn. Cruise speed, 182 miles per hour, 293 kilometers per hour, 158 kn. Range, 2,000 miles, 1,738 nmi, 3,219 kilometers, with 6,000 pounds, 2,700 kilograms, bomb load. Service ceiling, 35,600 feet, 10,900 meters. Rate of climb, 900 feet per minute, 4.6 meters per second. Wing loading, 38.0 pounds per square foot, 186 kilograms per square meter. Power, mass, 0.089 horsepower per pound, 150 with kilogram. Armament. Guns, 13 times .50 in 12. 7 mm M2 Browning machine guns in 9 positions 2 in the Bendix chin turret, 2 on nose cheeks, 2 staggered waist guns, 2 in upper Sperry turret, 2 in Sperry ball turret in belly, 2 in the tail and 1 firing upwards from radio compartment behind bomb bay bombs, short range missions long range missions approximately equals 800 miles, 4,500 pounds pounds 2000 kilograms overload 17600 pounds 7800 kilograms topic notable appearances in media topic see also Air warfare of World War E Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress variants B-17 Flying Fortress units of the United States Army Air Forces Accidents and incidents involving the B-17 Flying Fortress related development Boeing XB-15 Boeing XB-38 Flying Fortress Boeing YB-40 Flying Fortress Boeing C-108 Flying Fortress Related lists List of bomber aircraft List of aircraft of World War II List of military aircraft of the United States